All right, so now we're going to talk about osmosis and water moving from one side of the membrane to the other. So osmoregulation is going to be the way that a cell can kind of control how much water is coming in or it's letting out. Sometimes that doesn't work very well, and we'll talk about situations like that in a little bit. Um, so when water moves across a membrane, it's going to use these guys called aquaporins. Anything that ends in IN is usually a protein. And so what these are going to be are specific membrane proteins that are going to be involved in allowing water to go across the membrane. Okay, so the rate that water is going to go across the membrane can be t determined by a couple of different things. One would be if the solutes are not able to cross the membrane, that's probably going to slow the water down because they could be clogging up those pores. The other thing is the concentration of water in the solution. So if you have a really, really, really high amount of water over here and a really low amount here, then that's going to happen really quickly, whereas if you have like pretty even amounts, it's not going to happen as quickly. So. Um, our cells can basically be in three different states depending on water concentration in a solution. So um, they're going to be relative terms. We're going to go through these a lot. But basically, a cell can be either in a hypertonic solution, hypotonic solution, or isotonic. Now, I made some drawings here to show you uh, what I'm talking about. And so in each of these, what I want you to get out of this is that <clears throat> the little dots that you see are solutes. So we could say that's salt or sugar or whatever it is. And the space that you see, that blank space, is water. Okay? So this solution here, we have a high concentration of solutes as opposed to inside the cell, right? So there's going to be a lot of solutes out here, not a lot in here. And so it works inversely with water. There's a lot of water out here but in the cell, but not a lot out here, okay? So this type of solution is going to be called a hypertonic solution. I'm just going to write S-O-L apostrophe N. That's shorthand for that. Okay, so hyper means high, right? Um, tonic is talking about solutes. So this is saying that the solution the cell is sitting in has a whole bunch of solutes floating around. Now in this situation, it's different, right? In this situation, we have a whole bunch of solutes, like salt or sugar, inside the cell, and not a lot of them outside the cell. And so there's more water outside the cell. So this one is going to be called a hypotonic Oops, that should be a C. Oh, flur. A hypotonic solution, right? Um, solution. Okay. Then um, over here, you look, it looks pretty even, right? So this is going to be called an isotonic solution. Iso means equal, right? Okay, so what I want you to understand about this is that all of these terms are relative, and I'll show you what I mean. In this first example here, we've got a hypertonic solution. What that means is the solution is hypertonic compared to the cell. There are more solutes in the solution compared to the cell. If we look the other direction, though, I could say that the cell is hypotonic compared to the solution it's sitting in. I'll let that kind of mull over for a bit, right? So if we're talking about the solution down here, the opposite word will describe the cell. So a cell sitting in a hypertonic solution is hypotonic compared to the solution. So here, the cell is sitting in a hypotonic solution, and that means the cell, relatively speaking, is hypertonic compared to the solution it's sitting in. And isotonic is just isotonic, right? Now, the next thing that we need to discuss is um, what's going to happen with water when we have this going on. So if we look over here in this picture, the space is going to be water, right? So technically, there is a high amount of water inside the cell and a low amount of water outside the cell. So water is going to exit the cell. So we'll say water exits the cell. Does that make sense? Because there's more water in the cell than outside the cell. So the water is going to exit the cell. In this situation, all of this space is water. There's more water, high, 
uh, low outside the cell versus inside the cell. So what's going to happen is water is going to go into the cell. So I'll say water enters the cell. And in an isotonic solution, it just kind of goes back and forth. It doesn't really do much of anything, right? So why do we care? Well, in this situation here, I'll use a different color. In this situation here, what's going to happen if you have water exits the cell, then it's going to do something called crenating. Okay, so the cell is going to crenate. What that means is it's going to look like a raisin. All the water is going to exit the cell and that's basically it. Over here, we're going to have water going into the cell, so the cell could do something called lysing. Lysing is exploding, so the cell is actually going to explode in that situation. And over here, we'll say the cell is just plain old happy, right? Because that's where it likes to be. Now, I should mention, this is in the case of animal cells. Plant cells, totally different situation, and I will write that on here in a second, okay? So animal cells like to be in an isotonic solution. In a hypertonic solution, they're going to do what's called crenating, and crenating is going to cause them to look like a raisin. In a hypotonic solution, they're going to take on water so much that they could explode, and they're happiest in an isotonic solution, okay? Oh, no, I didn't mean to say clear. Oh, good, it didn't. Oh, God, that would have sucked. Okay, so... Now, I'm going to write up here in green what happens with plant cells. Plant cells are going to be different. Okay, so what happens with a plant cell is here, the plant cell is going to be what we call flaccid. And so, if you've ever seen plants where they're alive, but they're kind of just like drooped over, they're wilted, okay? Um, so, what that means is they don't have enough water pressure in them to push on those cell walls to hold them up, okay? So, they're going to look flaccid. Um, in a hypotonic solution, what's going to happen with a plant cell is it's actually going to be its happiest here, and it's going to be turgid. And I'll write a oops, and I'll write up here, happy. Okay, so plant cells are going to be happiest here. Turgid means it's taking on so much water that it's pushing out on the cell walls, and it can actually kind of hold itself up. Then over here in a hypertonic solution, what can actually happen is plas molysis. Now you've heard of lysis, which is exploding. Um, it's kind of different. Um, what's going to happen is the cell wall is going to stay intact, but all of the cell membrane is going to actually pull away from it, and it's actually going to cause it to kind of fold in on itself. So if you've ever seen a plant that's dead, that's all crispy, you can still see the shape that the plant had, but it's all brown and crispy because all those cell membranes have kind of imploded on themselves. So that's going to be how the different types of cells are going to be happiest. Now, <clears throat> when you get a, an IV, mm, let's see. Oh, yeah, and here's a great picture, too. So on the top are animal cells. On the bottom are going to be plant cells. So an animal cell in a hypotonic solution, which means water will go in, the animal cell will explode because it doesn't have that cell wall to protect it. In a plant cell, it's going to be happiest, right? It's going to be in its normal state where it's standing up. In an isotonic solution, an animal cell is going to be happy, but a plant cell, even though it's not dead, is going to be kind of wilty because it doesn't have that pressure pushing out. Then, <clears throat> an animal cell in a hypertonic solution, it's going to just shrivel up and crenate, and a plant cell is going to do that whole plasmolysis thing. So you can see that the cell wall is still intact, but the cell membrane is pulled away and actually kind of imploded on itself. Okay, so those are going to be the different ways that they're going to work. All righty, so we talked about that, we talked about that. Now, when you get an IV, your IV is not going to be 100% water, and that's because you have salts and things in your cells. So when you get that saline solution in an IV, it could be 0.9% salt because that is putting your cells in an isotonic situation. Think about what would happen if you gave someone an IV of pure water. If you gave someone an IV of pure water, you're going to create an environment where the cells are going to be surrounded by a hypotonic solution. So if we go back, the hypotonic solution situation, water is going to go into the cells and cause them to explode. So that's why you would never give someone an IV of pure water, right? 
All righty. So the last little bit here is just talking about um, moving bulk amounts of stuff into and out of cells. And I actually think I've got... Um, do I have those videos? Maybe I don't. Um, but anyway, exocytosis and endocytosis. I'll post some videos for you guys. Um, exocytosis is going to be a whole bunch of stuff exiting the cell. And um, I can actually kind of draw you what I'm talking about here. Um, and so this would be a situation where the cell has a whole bunch of waste that it wants to just get rid of at once, right? Um, so we've got our cell, and it's going to form a vacuole that has all that like waste and stuff in it. And what's going to happen is that vacuole is going to move, and it's going to eventually kind of fuse with the cell membrane here, and then it's going to actually dump the contents out, and the membrane has never really been compromised, right? So it's going to kind of fuse with the membrane and dump its stuff out. Endocytosis is the opposite. Endocytosis is going to be where you have something that wants to get into the cell and it's going to get closer and closer until it actually fuses with the cell membrane and then it can dump the contents out back in the inside. Okay, so exocytosis, think of something exiting the cell. Endocytosis, things are coming into the cell. That's how you can tell the difference between the two. Whoops. <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. Um, so as far as endocytosis goes, there's a whole lot of situations where that would happen. Um, when the cell wants to actually take in food or when it needs to get something transported to somewhere else, it can do that. Um, and then there's also a form of it called phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is going to be where um, it's going to actually surround something and like almost eat it. And there is a great video I'm going to pull up on YouTube about this. www.youtube.com. Um, white blood cell. Okay, so your white blood cells do phagocytosis all the time. And I just think this is such a rad video um, that somebody took through a microscope. And so what you'll see here is this is a bacteria and that is a white blood cell that's chasing it. And those are red blood cells it's pushing out of the way. And this is what your white blood cells are supposed to do. So you can see it's chasing after it and eventually what it's going to do is it's going to completely phagocytose it, which is what it's supposed to do. So it's just pushing those red blood cells out of the way and there we go phagocytosis it's just kind of taking it in and it's going to eat it right so um, we're really lucky that our white blood cells do that because that is what's keeping us healthy right now another thing that they can do is something called penocytosis and that's like if you have a cell that wants to take in a big amount of water and so it'll just kind of do that same endocytosis process but using water so that's going to be membranes, and um, we will talk more about that in lab and all of that other stuff, so enjoy.